So in this chapter, chapter four, we're looking at um, we're looking at the demand curve, and we're looking at consumer choice. So this is a, admittedly, this is a pretty, um, how do I put it nicely, abstract chapter. Um, the other way to read that would be that this is a pretty boring chapter. Um, but it it is important because it is the fundamental basis of this first half of the course where we begin by looking at consumer choice and then look at producer choice. Producer choice is going to make a lot, it's just going to be a lot clearer because it, it makes more sense to think of a business producing stuff and having to buy inputs, having to buy labor to produce something. That makes sense. Here, we're talking about... Um, we're talking about consumers having their happiness translated into something known as utility, and then um, that there is some internal calculation that they're doing to um, uh, to make the appropriate choice of a certain number of products versus a different um, product. So. Um, with that said, what we're going to do first is look again at the demand curve. Now, again, you obviously know the basics of the demand curve, but we're going to revisit the issue of why the demand curve is downward sloping. In Econ 130, we just said that there was a law of demand. And um, depending on who you had as a professor and how much time they had, they probably didn't go into too much detail about why the law of demand exists. We will do that here, and we will do that um, in um, section one and two. Then we'll bring that all forward to talk about the income effect and the substitution effect, something that you likely did not cover at Econ 130 and basically talks about the two things that happen when the price changes. And then we finish it off by talking about consumer surplus and network externalities, which will um, be a little bit less abstract and so make a bit more sense. Okay. So I'm going to keep um, the slides at this size, if only because... Um, I don't want to have to cut um, through things too often. So the um, the when the price changes, the things that happen when the price changes is that two things change. Now, let's actually insert a slide here because they're, they're kind of... Um, Jumping ahead here, let's talk about, let me go back a slide here, and I'm going to insert a slide. Holy shit. <laughs> uh, I just want a blank slide. And I want to draw. Okay. So, if you remember from the previous chapter, uh, Sorry, I'm not being sure that my pen is working here. Ah, my pen's not working. Well, oh, that's pretty bad. Uh, let me pause this and try to get it to work. Okay, we got it working, I think. So, um, let's remember what we got going on here. So, if we've got a market for, let's say, oranges, then right on the x-axis, we'd have the quantity, and on the y-axis, we'd have the price. And we would know that the demand curve is downward sloping. That we already know from Chapter 2, just a review of supply and demand. 
And then if we say, um, sorry, not let's not put that there. Sorry, quantity of oranges and quantity of apples. And we do this to create a, um, a space in terms of preferences. If the price of apples is $1 and the price of oranges are $2 and I have a $50 income, then the most I could consume are 25 oranges, right? Which is just $50 divided by two. Or if I was buying apples, I could buy 50 apples because it'd be $50 total income divided by the price of apples, one. And there would be my budget constraint line. If income is 50, price of apples remains one, price of oranges is now five, then this stays here, except now it pivots from the same y-intercept and the x-intercept is now closer to the origin because it would be 50 divided by 5, which is 10. If income equals 50, price of apples remains 1 and price of oranges becomes 1, Then it would say pivot still from the same y-intercept, except now my x-intercept is at 50. So you get this idea of the budget constraint moving, shifting, pivoting, as I change just the price of the good on the x-axis. Okay. Now, imagine this. Uh, let's put it in a different color here. So imagine that I create my series of indifference curves that are all exactly parallel to one another, all have a constant level of utility, which is continually getting higher as I go left to right. But look at what happens here. My optimal number of oranges that I'm buying is increasing as the price falls, which is exactly what's happening over here. As the price is falling, which we signal over here, as the movement from the blue budget constraint to the purple budget constraint to the green budget constraint. As the price is falling, the number of oranges purchased is increasing. That's the movement along the curve, as demonstrated by this graph right here. Okay, let's see if it'll let me... Oh, uh, it's going to make me erase it all, I think. Oh, no, it didn't. Okay, perfect. Well, that's what's happening in this very beautiful picture here. But, dude, if, if I wasn't explaining it, I don't think this slide intuitively would tell us the same thing. But it is in a much cleaner looking fashion. What this graph is showing us is, just as I showed you, that in this case, the price of food is falling. Price of clothing is staying constant and income is staying constant. And as the price falls, the budget constraint pivots outwards. And the optimal quantity of food increases from 4 
to 12 to 20. And look at what happens, especially in this display here, where you don't do it side by side, but you do it as a drop down graph. You then just keep the line going down, and now you're just going to represent the price of the food, which wasn't represented here explicitly. It was implicit behind the um, budget constraint. But as the price went from 2 to 1 to 50 cents, we had the optimal quantity of 4, 12, and 20. Let's try to go back here. Right, the alternative here would be, uh, let's try to do, let's try to do this, let's try to rescue this. I'm just going to erase this temporarily. Go back to pen. And then put over here, price of oranges, quantity of oranges. And if I drawn this exactly the same, <laughs> Uh, now, how do I know how far to drop it down? Well, that's given to us by what the price is. Here it was one. Here it was, um, what did I have it as? Uh, two. And here I had it as five. And there you go. There's my demand for oranges. Okay. Now you get a price consumption curve, which is just, as you see here, is just this line that just connects the optimal points within their budget constraint um, in difference curve space, which is fine. Um, I mean, it, um, it gives us some information that obviously is already contained in the demand curve. But the reason why this slide is so important is because it, is, it tells us two things. Well, um, actually, it says to us three things. I'm going to add a third thing. tells us three things. So let's go back to our quantity of oranges, price of oranges, demand curve. There are three things that are true as we go from A to B. Now we know it goes from A to B because as the price of oranges falls, the quantity demanded of oranges rises. That we know from the law of demand. But three things are happening as we move from A to B. First, each of these points have a level of utility attached to them. And um, so each A, B, and C each have a level of utility attached to them. And as I'll write for number three here, the total utility is increasing as we go from left to right along the graph. How do I know that? I know that because as I move to a higher point along this demand curve, I'm on a indifference curve that's further from the origin. And remember, indifference curves that are further from the origin have more utility attached to them. So this point here has higher utility attached to it because it's associated with the indifference curve furthest from the origin. Point number two. What we also know is that each point along the demand curve 
A, B, and C in this case, represent an optimal point in terms of consumption. What that means is that, remember, at each and every point here, where, oh, yeah, where the indifference curve is touching the budget constraint, let's look at what's happening at B here. At B, the ratio of food to clothing, that price ratio, is equal to the marginal utility from food over the marginal utility of clothing, both negative. Cross multiply, and what you get, sorry, I have to put it way over here, at B, that the marginal utility of food over the price of food is equal to the marginal utility of clothing over the price of clothing. Each, at each of these points, this is true. At each point, the consumer is maximizing their utility subject to the prices. I'll repeat that again. Oh, fuck. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I hope you're going to have to rewind the video a little bit at that point. Oh, snap. Look at that. It just, like, plowed it all through, dude. Sorry about that. Um well, you can rewind the video. Um, the third point is that, or sorry, I was talking about the second point. At each point on the demand curve, the consumer is maximizing their utility subject to their constraint. The constraint being what their income level is and the prices that they're presented for each goods, each of the two goods. Okay. Now, we know that we move along the demand curve as we change the price. But what we also remember from Econ 130 is that we shift the demand curve when the income changes. Now, how we shift it depends on what kind of good it is, if it's a normal good or an inferior good. So let's start here with this product being a um, normal good. So in the case of this being a normal good, then um, the way that we would represent having more income would be that the budget constraint shifts outwards. And, sorry about that. As the budget constraint shifts outward because the income is going up, then the optimal point will increase. And what you can see here, is that now price of food is constant, price of clothing is, in, is constant, but income is increasing. And the person buys more now of both goods. If we just simplify that to be one of the two products, we can now justify with the indifference curve budget constraint space why it's the case that the demand curve shifts when it's a normal good. This is called the income consumption curve. But what you can see in the, in the drop-down graph is that as income increases, and in the, again, in the top graph that's represented by the budget constraint, the blue line, parallel shifting outwards, that what you can see is that A, B, and D represent the optimal points that exist as the income was increasing. And that as that income is increasing and the consumer is um, buying more of both of the goods, we can do a drop down graph for just the good on the x axis. And we would see that the price of food stayed constant, in this case at $1, but the person was buying more. And the only way that can happen is by parallel shifting outwards the demand curve. If you wanted to represent clothing instead of food, you'd have to do it as a side-by-side -side graph <laughs> where quantity of clothing was here, price of clothing was here. <laughs> okay. 
and you'd have to do it this way. Um, for a constant price of, sorry, for a constant price of clothing, and you would have your higher demand curve out here now because you're looking at it side by side. How do you like that for psychedelic craziness? Now, what is different for an inferior good? Remember, for an inferior good, the demand curve is still downward sloping. But for an inferior good, the income consumption curve eventually bends backwards. As opposed to the normal good, where the income consumption curve just keeps going outwards. Instead here, for the inferior good, this again is a kind of good where um, as people have more resources, as people become better off, they consume less of the product bus pass. Um, I don't know, uh, used cars, that kind of thing. If you have more income, you don't buy more used cars, you buy a new car. So um, what you see is that as the income is going higher here, in this case, people eventually buy less hamburger. It bends backwards. So it's such that B is at a higher quantity than C's point. Now, it's important sometimes to graph out what's called the Engel curve. And what the Engel curve does for us is it changes the axes such that now instead of the price of food, we're looking at the income of food. And the shape of the Engel curve can tell us whether the product is a normal good or an inferior good and exactly at what income it becomes that way. We can see with food in the top graph that food is a normal good. Uh, I guess that means that... Uh, it's not really... This is pretty... Um, eh, this is a, lo a little bit inaccurate here. You can't be saying this. The problem here is that rich people don't eat more. Well... Rich people do eat more than poor people, but the richer you become, it's not, you don't eat more food. It's not like, um, oh, what's that movie, Seven? Oh, remember where that guy like eats all that spaghetti or something? It's not like that. Um, rich people aren't like that guy in Seven. Um, uh, it's that, and I'm not rich, I'm just <laughs> hypothesizing here. Uh, rich people buy fancier food. Fancier food is usually in smaller quantities and cut differently. And it's like, I don't know, like organically grown with, you know, like cow dreams. Whereas like McDonald's, right, is just like, I don't know, cows that like, you know, were unlucky enough to be killed to be made into hamburgers. Um Rich people don't eat at McDonald's typically. They go to, well, first they go to Five Guys, right? That would be their first step up. Then they go to like, I don't know, some, I don't even know where rich people go. I don't know, there's probably some fancy Japanese chef that makes, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's that one? Uh, um, uh, what is that? The one where the, the cow doesn't move around a lot, so the beef is really soft. One of you knows as I'm saying this. But anyway, a Japanese chef that makes that kind of beef and, you know, that kind of hamburger, that's what rich people buy. So instead of food units, I should say something like um, food allocation. I guess it'd be the best way to say it because people basically allocate more money to food as their income goes up. They just buy different kinds of food. What would be useful 
for you uh, if you worked in marketing to know would be you would want to know what the angle curve looks like for your product because you want to know if you're McDonald's at what point does a consumer go to your restaurant more and at what point do they start going to the alternative that tipping point because then what you would do is you would design a marketing campaign to try to get those consumers to still come to you. Um, the best example I can think of for this is um, I like flying Southwest Airlines. It's just a convenient airline. It's You don't have to worry about like elite lists and all that kind of junk. It's like pretty darn simple. You got... Uh, you buy the ticket, you check in the day before, you're given a letter and a number, and then you sit in the line and then you pick your seat. Pretty darn easy. But at the same time, you know, is a, you know, a person going on business, are they going to want to have to like get to the airport early and stand in this weird line? And, you know, you know, if a, um, business passengers paying more they want to feel like they're getting more and so what southwest airlines has done is they've created a business fair class where you get like i don't know some liquor you don't have to like fight for your place in line and if your travel plans change they give you all your money back like back to your credit card and so what they successfully did is they got the richer people to still buy the Southwest product. Now, eventually, those business people are going to fly private. You can't stop that. So eventually, it will turn back again. But you want it so that it switches at a much higher level of income. And um, you kind of see this description here. Um, <laughs> Again, food. <coughs> food is a normal good, um, and people aren't buying more units of food. They're just spending more on food. Healthcare. People are going to better hospitals, and they're getting more preventative treatment. Clothing. You know, well, rich people buy more clothing, and they buy, like, better styles and stuff like that. Now, renting here does become inferior at some point. It switches at some point. Because, right, in this case, it, as people get more and more income, they, you see this kind of bump right here? Well, that would be someone like moving out of your parents' house and getting your own place, that kind of thing. But eventually you get to a point where, you're like, dude, you make that much money and you still rent? Like, what's going on, dude? Um, you eventually have to buy your own house. So that would be own dwelling, which you see as a normal good. And then entertainment, normal good. Yeah, rich people do go to more performances, but they go to performances, right? They're not like streaming something on someone's borrowed Netflix password. You know, they're going to see like, I don't know, some opera or play or something like that, <laughs> which reminds me of my my wife wanted to um, watch a movie. And, um, you know, I don't really keep up on movies that much. And she said, oh, do you want to do you want to watch um, Pitch Perfect with me? And I was like, ah, oh, sounds like a baseball movie. Yeah, I'll totally watch that. You know, I didn't say it sounds like a baseball movie. That's what I'm thinking in my head. I'm like, I love sports. I love athletics. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll totally watch that. You know, we sit down and like people are like singing everywhere. And I'm like, what the, you know, I, and then I say to her, I thought this was a baseball movie. And then I found out in case you haven't seen the movie, it's actually like pitch in terms of like the um, pitch of their voice because they're singing, not um, pitching like in baseball or softball, um, which is quite, um, it was a quite a long movie. And then I heard that they make multiple of them. Um, can't imagine can't imagine where the story goes after the first one but 
I don't know. I like National Treasure. Um, everyone's got their own preferences, as we see in this chapter. Okay. And again, uh, this is just graphing it out. This is just explaining what I've all just said here. But um, if you're involved in marketing, you want to know what these angle curves look like. If you're selling a banking product, let's say you work for Banco or you work for First Hawaiian, right? You offer several different kinds of checking accounts, right? You offer like the student account, you offer like the free checking, then you offer like premier checking, you offer, right, like all these different ways to get out of like fees and whatnot. That's all an attempt. You don't just offer a single checking account. You like offer these different kinds of products so that you can get wealthier people to bank with you as well as poor state employees like myself. Um, you're just better off, right? Unless, unless you don't want poor customers, right? Because you're selling a prestige product. Um, I, I, I haven't bought many prestige products in my life, but, um, it's like the second story now I'm telling you what, um, second time I'm telling a story about this, but, um, my wife's, um, engagement and wedding band are from Tiffany's and, um, you know, I, I, know, I was starting out as a professor. I didn't have a lot of money or anything, but, um, that's where I bought my rings. Um, they don't have a discount section in that store, right? It, it's a certain clientele that they, um, that they seek. Um, so it, about the only thing that's like low level is like that, like, um, they make like an anklet bracelet or like one of those like things that's like shaped like a lock and a heart. Um, but it's made of sterling silver and it's for like teenagers, um, it's not right to get them to eventually buy Tiffany stuff, but you, there's no, like, um, how else I put, there's no state employee section at the Tiffany's, uh, right? There are small, smaller rings, but they're still much more expensive, let's say per carat or per weight of the wedding band than, um, you know, if I were to go on like blue Nile.com, which is like the internet, uh, version. So again, it's helpful if you're selling a product to know who your clientele is and who you want as your clientele. Most businesses really want to expand things out and they want all different kinds of customers. Shift that point where the angle curve bends backwards to inferior. Um, but again, it might be part of your marketing plan that you don't want poor customers. It's not, you know, it's just what you do. It's your thing. Um, it's not a um, judgment call on my part. What do I know? I'm just a professor. Um, now, let's review here what we have going on in terms of substitutes and complements. Um, for substitutes and complements, what we're saying here is um, that if products are substitutes, that as the price of the substitute goes up, that consumers might um, buy the other good to fulfill a similar need. So an example would be 1% and 2% milk are substitutes for most people. Um, you know, you get extreme cases like, you know, I have an infant at home and in her case, um, you know, we try to do whole milk, which is like the fattiest, right? But then, you know, we don't want like our other kids to get like super fat from drinking milk. So they get to drink the 1% milk. Now, right. So here I'm just trying to balance things. But, you know, if I lived in a household where like we didn't have a baby, we probably all would just drink 1% because 1% you know, tastes like milk, as does 2%. I can't really taste the difference between the two. Um, Menehune water to me tastes the same as Aloha water, 
to me, it tastes the same. They're substitutes. If you're selling a product, this what you would call this is knowing who your competition is. Um, to the extent that you then develop a marketing plan to say that your two products are different, or you develop a marketing plan to justify why your product costs more than the other. And where we see that, a great example of substitutes would be in the computer market, right? So, um, you know, I use a an Apple at work. Um, I use an iMac, so it's like the thing that's like all in one. So it's all the screen is also the computer and it's pretty expensive. So when I had to buy a computer for my oldest son and I looked at the prices, there was no way I was gonna buy that kind of computer, at least for a nine year old. So for me, it was the same as an all in one computer that Dell made. And Dell's computer was like $450 as opposed to like $1,500 for an Apple. And so the only way that Apple can justify it, right, is saying, like now they, they can do it pretty well because they can say, well, you've got an iPhone, you've got an iWatch, you've got um, all of these other Apple products. If your computer is also an Apple, then everything is going to work with each other. Um, you know, my son's nine. He doesn't need all that shit. Um, he can live without it because it doesn't justify, in my case, the $1,100 price difference. Um, but, you know, for other kinds of customers, they might not be aware of that or have that kind of marketing plan for that. And so to the extent, in this case, we, you know, if we think of the all the things that Apple has, in terms of other products, the phone, the watch, Apple TV, the speaker, um, those Apple tags, all of those things keep you in that Apple space, making the Dell computer seem like less and less of a substitute. The only other example I can think of that goes back to Apple, which has done a pretty good job of making other competitors not seem like substitutes would be texting. Think about it. When you text someone from an iPhone and they have an Android, when it's green, dude, like that's just like a total turnoff for me. Like, I have no idea if you read it. I don't know when you're replying. I mean, dude, it's like you, um, you're so, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's just, it's different to deal with. And so what have they managed to do, right? Is that if you have a not, if you have an Apple product, you get a blue um, symbol, right? And you know when people read stuff. Um, Android, and Go Android, which is, you know, a Google product. Google is unhappy. They want everyone to be able to have that kind of information. And technically it is possible but Apple obviously doesn't want that because the moment they do that, then an Android phone becomes a closer substitute to an Apple iPhone. Um, the compliments, for the compliments, um, the two goods are compliments. If by consuming one, you also consume the other. It makes me sound like a crazy Apple person, but Apple also does a good, um, good work with this as well, right? Because this would be an individual buying a Apple keyboard, an Apple mouse with their Apple computer and having an iPhone and that these goods are related to each other in that kind of way. The other example of compliments would be like pen and paper, um, cars and tires, cars and gasoline. 
And there, if you're marketing that kind of product, you again need to be aware of how your product, the demand for your product is affected by the price of other goods that you may have no control over. And the, alter the, the third alternative is that goods could be independent. If goods are independent, then um, the price of one good has no effect on the demand for the other good. So what that leads us to is starting to think about the income and substitution effect. Both of these things happen at the same time. Both of these things happen at the same time when there's a price change. Changing the price leads to both of these things. Um, I'm going to pause it here just to give my voice a break here. One second. So actually what I'll do here is I will um, stop the video here because at this point the lecture is getting pretty long. And so I'll stop the video here and this will be the end of part one. Part two will start then with the discussion of income and substitution effect, which should be new for probably everyone in this class. So this will end part one of our discussion of chapter four.